All righty. So 1 Thessalonians, we're going to look at verses 7, uh, 2, 17 through 3, 13. And it's interesting enough, um, my title for today's sermon was The Necessity of Encouragement. And this series through 1 Thessalonians is labeled Future Thoughts and how our thoughts of the future that is certain in Christ, the hope that is certain in Christ, grounded in the reality of what he has done, is what then brings us into our current life, our current moment, our current time. And how today, with me thinking of the necessity of encouragement, I think about how we have access to so much information so quickly. Like, to this morning, I have been following someone who I raced against in high school. He is competing in the New York City Marathon this morning. And I actually have an app on my phone giving me updates for every five kilometers. And, and you know, actually a, a message came to my phone, uh, to my watch, whenever he crossed the half point. And it's just crazy that we can get instant updates on how people are doing. So we can actually get instant status of encouragement and items like that. Where Paul, on the other hand, if he wanted to know how someone was doing in their marathon, which they wouldn't, because the marathon back then was something that you only did if you were, you know, running to report something super big. Um, I mean, it would have been weeks that they probably have been waiting on information from long distances away. Um, versus today, we have instant access. But even with our instant access to information, we stand inside of the same situation as the city of Thessalonica did in the first century where we need encouragement. Now, when I say encouragement, I, I'm talking about the broad range of encouragements. Um, something as simple as saying, it's good to see you, or something as simple as, hey, that's a nice lucky haircut, or, you know, thank God for the rain, or, or things as deep as a deep conversation where someone speaks into a hurt and they are able to put a word of healing on the pain in your life. Encouragement is a big area that we need in life. And Paul, as he's talking to the church in the city of Thessalonica, he desires to encourage them, which is why he wrote the letter, but he also had received encouragement from them. And so we're going to think about the necessity of encouragement in the life of a believer by looking at this passage. So I'm going to read 1 Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians 2, 17 through 3, 13, and then we're going to look at paragraphs at a time. So follow along. But brothers and sisters, when we were orphaned by being separated from you for a short time, in person, not in thought, out of our intense longing... We made every effort to see you. We wanted to come to you. Certainly I, Paul, did again and again, but Satan blocked our way. For what is our hope, our joy, or the crown in which we will glory in the presence of our Lord when, we, when he comes? Is it not you? Indeed, you are our glory and joy. So when we could stand it no longer, we thought it best to be left by ourselves in Athens. We sent Timothy, who is our brother and co-worker in God's service, in spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ, to strengthen and encourage you in your faith, so that no one would be unsettled by these trials. For you know quite well that we were destined for them. In fact, when we were with you, we kept telling you that we would be persecuted. And it turned out that way, as you well know. For this reason, when I could stand it no longer, I sent to find out about your faith. I was afraid that in some way the tempter had tempted you and that our labors might have been in vain. But Timothy has just now come to us from you and has brought good news about your faith and love. He has told us that you always have pleasant memories of us and that you long to see us just as we also long to see you. Therefore, brothers and sisters, in all our distress and persecution, we were encouraged about you because of your faith. For now we really live, since you stand firm in the Lord. How can we thank God enough for you in return for all the joy that you have in the presence of our God because of you? 
Night and day we pray most earnestly that we may see you again and supply what is lacking in your faith. Now may our Lord, now may our God and Father himself and our Lord clear the way for us to come to you. May the Lord make your love increase and overflow for each other and for everyone else, just as ours does for you. May he strengthen your hearts so that you will be blameless and holy in the presence of our God and Father when our Lord Jesus Christ comes with, with all his holy ones. Do you see how big encouragement is inside of this passage? Paul sees it as being a necessary framework that he that the, the need of encouragement that this letter is sent. He's sending Timothy. He himself wants to see people. He desires to have this situation occur where he can see them, tell them, strengthen them, and make sure that they're on the right path. Now, this past, the passage that we read today, it starts off with this unit where Paul talks about how his ways to get to the church of Thessalonica have been blocked. He longs to see them, but he can't. Now, first off, I want to point out that he says, I wanted to see you in person because I was separated physically, though not in thought. So you see that in verse 17. And this ties into something that's in a lot of Paul's letters, where he talks about being in spirit with other believers in other churches. So something that I want to give to you right now is the reality of the encouragement that you are united through Jesus Christ with other believers around the world. Now this sounds kind of mystical. This goes against kind of our idea of being the Lone Ranger, you know, Western cowboy type faith that we want to have of the rugged individualism. But know that through our faith, because of Jesus Christ, you never stand truly alone and isolated. So Paul, though separated from the church in Thess uh, the Thessalonian church, he doesn't become discouraged that about their situation, thinking there's no possible way because I'm not there that they can be strengthened. He realizes that the physical separation does not overcome the reality of the spiritual connection they have in Jesus. Now, why is this important? It's important because Paul lists all these ways that they can be separated. But he's able to stand firm in this reality that they're not broken apart. The unity that we have in Jesus Christ cannot be fractured even if there's physical separation. But as he's trying to meet again with them, Paul mentions that in verse 18, I tried again and again, but Satan blocked our ways. So part of what increased Paul's intense longing to be with the church in Thessalonica was that he couldn't physically get there. Something blocked him. Now, Paul did something where he said, Satan kept me from being with you. Now, I want to touch on something that is, uh, I've seen a resurgence in modern, in the last year of people blaming the devil for everything. Now, this is not what Paul is doing. Paul had a very rich theological understanding of human brokenness and the world being brokenness and things not happening simply because we live in a broken world. Paul knew because he walked deeply with Jesus the difference between him not being able to get to Thessalonica because the weather was bad and Paul not being able to get to Thessalonica because Satan was blocking his way. Now, I point this out because I am tired of people who should see the reality that we live in a broken world. So brokenness happens. Every single person around you has a level of weakness and frailty. It's just part of the reality of the world we're living in. 
The devil is not behind every bad thing going on in your life. And I say this because whenever we view everything negative in our life as satanic oppression, we then can champion ourselves because we think, well, why would the devil oppose me? Well, it has to be because I am so great. And do you see how Paul's not trying to make himself be, you know, Satan being the object of every reason that he's failing in his, in his life. He's saying specifically, I can't get to you in Thessalonica because Satan is blocking my way. And I point this out because you might have a bad day and it's not because the devil's trying to get you down. You might have a bad day tomorrow because we live in a broken world and our bodies can break. If I twist my ankle playing basketball, I would be silly to say that Satan's attacking me. This is not twisting my ankle in basketball. This is Paul trying to strengthen a church in its faith being an apostle of God, bringing the gospel to a city, and he knew that Satan was blocking his way. Let's not make all of the events in our life try to be as special as what Paul was doing. And I say this also to encourage you, is because whenever you think the devil is lurking around every corner trying to get you, you're focusing on the wrong thing. Focus on the reality that the Holy Spirit never leaves you. And we are promised in the Great Commission that Jesus walks with you. Which should you focus on during the day? The presence of God or the presence of evil? This is a very easy question. Which should you focus on more? The presence of God or the presence of evil? God. God. Okay. So, With this, Paul still sought to encourage the, the church in Thessalonica, even though he couldn't physically be present. He desired to see them because he understood that the people that he was visiting, the people that he knew, the people that he was writing to, were glorious jewels from God. Now, it sounds kind of weird to refer to someone as our crown of glory. But Paul understood that inside of the eternal reality that happens inside of God's plan of salvation, where he redeems things, where he makes things new, that the people that have been redeemed by Jesus Christ, who have been given a new life, a new, a new identity, a new personhood, that Paul was able to stand before the Lord with the joy and the confidence knowing that these people know the Lord because of what he's done. Now, what I don't want you to do is then have a view of people that your value and your worth is simply if you have are fruit of my ministry. But instead, what I want you to see is how this is a dear and cherished thing. I still can think about how there are a few people that I've known and I've ministered to and I think frequently about them. And it gives me strength and encouragement. There is a young man who is currently the director of a chapter of View for Christ. And I had the blessing of being a counselor at a junior high camp when he was in sixth grade. I mean, i sorry, he was this big. He could have actually been this big, but he seemed this big. He was just a little pipsqueak that I'm like, who are, like, he was just so tiny. Now, he's not tiny anymore, but I remember at that camp he said, I want to read my Bible every day. Ben, how do I do that? And now he's the director of a Youth for Christ. And I bring this up because I'm able to have the reality of his heart's status before God 
be hope and joy in my life. And this is where the necessity of encouragement is that we are unable to be encouraged whenever we only see the here and the now, or we only see the current trial, the current persecution, rather than stepping out and seeing the big picture that God has. So, let's talk more about the reality of the presence of persecution. So, in verse 1 of chapter 3, he says, So, when we could stand it no longer, we thought it best to be left by ourselves in Athens. We sent Timothy, who is our brother and co-worker in God's service in spreading the gospel of Christ. We sent him to strengthen and, and encourage you in your faith so that none of you would be unsettled by these trials. For you know quite well that we are destined for them. In fact, when we were with you, we kept telling you that we would be persecuted. And it turned out that way, as you well know. For this reason, when I could stand it no longer, I sent to find out about your faith. I was afraid that in some way the tempter had tempted you and that our labors might have been in vain. So, the reality of persecution and the reality of trials in life should cause each and every one of us to understand the necessity of encouragement. Now, it also then creates the need for encouragement in each of us. I'm sure every single one of us would like to have at least two more compliments a day. I have realized recently that we operate every day through so many lenses and so many assumptions. Doing something that you're supposed to do doesn't keep you from enjoying someone saying that you've done it right. So my athletes should do well in a race but they still thrive whenever I say, good job. Think even more so how we know, and I've said this probably every single week the last three weeks, the person sitting next to you could be going through something so much harder than you could ever imagine. When we look at our community, how much pain exists. People need encouragement. So Paul, with the understanding that the church in Thessalonica needed encouragement because they were facing persecution for their faith, as was mentioned in chapter 2, from the people who, from the Jewish community in Thessalonica, they were opposing those who were following Jesus. He said, I had to find out how you were doing. So I want to point out that there are, as I just said earlier, that the devil might not be behind every strained ankle, but Peter does mention that the devil does roar, does walk around like a roaring lion, desiring to devour our faith. Your faith in Jesus Christ is a proclamation of truth that Satan doesn't like. Because of that, those who don't love Jesus and are confronted by the fact that Jesus is love, joy, hope, and truth, they realize that that opposes their pride, their power, their possessions, their privilege. They might attack against you. Why is it that Jesus was so offensive to everybody? Because Jesus, he showed the presence of sin in the world. He showed that the power structures of the world were based upon sin and selfishness rather than what God desired. Everything about his life confronted the systems and structures and the individual sins of the people of his time. So because of that, the church in Thessalonica, who wanted to follow Jesus, were being opposed. 
The Jewish synagogues were like, we don't want to lose our converts. We don't want to lose our tithe money. We don't want to lose our followers. The people who were the idol makers and the leaders of the temples of idolatry were like, we don't want to lose our income of people following this Jesus guy because they're no longer coming, buying our sacrifices. They're no longer coming and buying our idols. They were going to be persecuted because Jesus changed the very reality of everything that existed in there. But this is where I want to point out persecution exists, so we must be encouraging. But also, persecution and trials offer us two distinct roads to walk on. The first, as verse 5 points out, is the reality that inside of trials and temptations, we can either walk with our faith and keep our faith, or we can acquiesce and live the way of the world. Trials can either cause us to be angry and bitter and frustrated and selfish and lashing out at others, or they can cause us to realize that Jesus is with us and then cause us to act in love, joy, and peace. It's very obvious when we look at Galatians, the fruit of the Spirit versus the deeds of the flesh. These are the two ways that we can walk whenever we are faced with persecution and trials. And because of that, we must encourage others, knowing that everyone around us is going through a trial or a persecution, that they should be strong and walk in the ways of the Lord. Meaning love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, Gentleness and faithfulness, too. Nothing about the way of the Lord is, I am me, I will stand on me and my ways, and no one will tell me what to do, though trials often make us be that way. The way of faith is not an isolation, but rather a realization of the body of Christ and living in light of it. So because of that, Paul sends Timothy. But Timothy had just come to us from you and has brought good news about your faith and love. He has told us that you always have pleasant memories of us and that you long to see us, just as we also long to see you. Therefore, brothers and sisters, in all our distress and persecution, we are encouraged about you because of your faith. For now, we really live since you are standing firm in the Lord. How can we thank God enough for you in return for all the joy we have in the presence of our God because of you? Night and day we pray most earnestly that we may see you again and supply what is lacking in your faith. Do not sleep on how important Timothy is. Timothy was the bearer of good news. He was the bringer of the encouraging report. He was the one who brought Paul's heart joy. Timothy had an important work to do, and he had an important role, which was to bring encouraging news and stories of people who were persevering to others. Are you carrying the stories of the gospel of Jesus Christ enduring, or are you being a bearer of bad news when you go around? Because I believe that as Christians, we should emulate, we should follow the example, we should try to be the same as Timothy, where we bring good news. Now, Paul, Paul was able to state that Timothy was bringing honest news, because Paul also had to hear lots of negative reports of things going on in different churches, but are you making sure you're sharing the good news of things that are happening? Now, here's something that I'm going to point out. In the current state and situation of how most of us hear reports of anything, negative news is what's heard. So anger and fear are what causes people to tune in 
to something. That's how a lot of news networks and news sources get clicks and listens and whatever other means. Negative news, unfortunately, is the best way to get an audience. As Christians, though, are we allowing ourselves to only listen to the negative news, or are we being people who seek out also the news and the truth of the encouragement of people walking in faith? Which is where I want to give, again, the example of the Voice of the Martyrs. The Voice of the Martyrs magazine, every month, gives you some pretty bad news. I mean, Nick and Randy, would you say there's some pretty bad news in those? But, is it just bad news? It gives the encouraging report of people who stand firm inside of that bad news. And because of that, is our heart drawn to the bad news, or is it drawn to the Lord who is glorious despite the bad news? And that's what it does. So, I encourage all of you again, Voice of the Martyrs, sign up for it. Read the missionary letters that we try to put out whenever they give us an update, and I put them out in the center, uh, out in the foyer. Sign up to Wickless News, New Tribes, any mission agency. They give monthly updates that they talk about the ways that things are happening. Sign up for them. But also ask yourself the question, would your testimony of how you're living right now bring encouragement to someone in the world? Or would it be discouraging? <clears throat> would that person hearing about your faith say, this person is a person of love, of hope, of joy, who sees the supremacy of Jesus and is not distracted by anything else in this world, or they go, wow, that's a person who just thinks about everything other than Jesus. Do you have current good news of faith? Because I want to tell you something. You do have good news of faith. You do have good things that are going on in your life, ways that you should be able to encourage someone where you see God working and moving, the ways that you see God pushing and prodding and prying. And that's what we should be focusing on. Because your perseverance inside of a trial or inside of a persecution brings strength to those around you. Why is it that we love those feel-good underdog stories of athletes? Why do we love Rocky? Well, obviously, there's a thousand reasons. The Rocky 3 and 4 training montage is being high on the list. But... Rocky Balboa. Sorry, for the two people who haven't seen the Rocky Balboa movies, I'm sorry. You're... I thought a reference from the 80s was, was a good reference. Um, Rocky was an underdog, out, of the, out on his luck boxer who was broke, who had no resources, yet was able to push through all of that to take on the heavyweight champion of the world in boxing. Why do we care? Why, why do pacifists like me, who think that punching every, anybody's stupid, want to watch a fight for on a TV? Like, I know it's all choreographed. No one actually gets hit. Although I think there's rumor that in Rocky IV. You know. Anyhow, it's because... The perseverance of someone who should have failed gives us encouragement that we, too, can persevere. This is why I also think the silly Hallmark movies matter. I mean, 
other than the fact there's $17 of budget that go into them, 18 for a good one. It's the fact that someone is down and out at the start of the movie, and rather than giving up on everything, we see that because they didn't give up, something good happens. We see this. So know that you, in your current situation, if you're actually thinking about breaking, know that Jesus hasn't abandoned you. Know that the Holy Spirit is present. Know that if you think you're alone, you're not. Know that your, pers that your perseverance also helps people persevere. This is also why I think it is crucial that we don't just tell about all the good things, but we talk about how there's the presence of bad things, like difficulties, and how you get through them. And one of the ways that we can help others get through their persecution is to earnestly pray for them night and day. It should be something that we can say with integrity is that we're praying for someone night and day. Paul then roots all of this desire to see the church in Thessalonica in a theological reality of Jesus, of God the Heavenly Father, and Jesus Christ, the Son of God, in their love for each other. Listen to this. Now may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus clear the way for us to come to you. May the Lord make your love increase and overflow for each other and for everyone else, just as ours does for you. May he strengthen your hearts that you may be blameless and holy in our presence, in the presence of our God and Father with our, when our Lord Jesus Christ comes with his Holy One. Paul realizes that the only ability for, the only way that he can see and be present with the church in Thessalonica is if God himself clears the way. But then his desire is that then his love and the love of the church in Thessalonica would overflow. And we see constantly throughout Paul's writings that this is a picture of may your love abound the same way that the love of the Father abounds for the Son, and the love for the Son abounds for the Father. Our interactions with each other should be the overflow of the love of God lavishing upon others. Now, an illustration that was given um, by one of my college professors was oftentimes we operate as if we are pitchers filled with God's love. Now, when we're filled up, then we go and we pour out. We're filled up, and then we go and we pour out. I want to offer to you a different example. Let's be reservoirs of God's love, where it is this constant connection with God's abundant love that then overflows towards others. Let's not stop and wait and then go to God when we need to get filled up, and then run out to others and pour our love, and then... Go back. Let's have love that's overflowing. And we cannot have an overflowing love if we are not deeply rooted in the truth of Jesus Christ. We become pitchers rather than reservoirs whenever we live for ourselves rather than God. We become pitchers rather than reservoirs whenever we look at the persecution and the trial rather than the God who is present. This is why I go back to, should you look at the devil or should you look at God? God. Because when you're looking at the devil, you're disconnecting yourself from the truth that God is with you. You're saying, I don't want to feel this love, this truth, this joy that overflows. This is why in James, it said that we can count our trials with joy. Because when we actually look at God inside of the midst of the brokenness of this world, the brokenness of our life, the brokenness of our flesh, we see that God loves us despite our failings. God loves us 
through our failures. God is gracious despite all that. And not only is he gracious, he loves us abundantly. He loves us more than you could ever imagine. It isn't because we persevere that God loves us. It's because God loves us that he loves us. And when we realize that, it causes our mind to realize that we don't have to operate in this moment by moment, step by step, transactional faith, but rather live inside of the reality that when you follow Jesus, you have been united with him inside of his death inside of his burial, inside of his resurrection, that you have become one with the Holy Spirit, it indwells you, and that you are connected with every believer in the world because you're part of the body of Jesus Christ. Through this, you can be able to let the overflow of God's love overflow to others. Now, I state this because how many of you have the mental dexterity to think that exact thought when things are bad in your life? <laughs> right? Ben, you just told me to think through an entire systematic theology book the moment something goes bad. This is why there's the necessity of encouragement. Because the person next to you needs you to tell them that they can do it. The person next to you needs you to pray for them. The person next to you also needs you to persevere in your faith. The person next to you needs you to point them to Jesus. The person next to you needs you to bring the good report. We have enough negative news that we as believers need to point people to the reality of God's love. How can you persevere in a broken world? You don't persevere in a broken world by trying to make your barracks, get your weapons, get your ammunition, figure out how to fight everybody. You face the world by being in Jesus and living inside of the hope of the resurrection and walking inside of the truth of the Holy Spirit being with you. You can never be prepared for whatever could come tomorrow. Did any of you prepare for the waters to overflow the river to cause us to be in a boil warning? I didn't. We can prepare for a lot of things. But you know what? Jesus doesn't say, try to prepare for every contingency so that way you can be happy and prepared. He says, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. That's our faith. That's our encouragement. We need encouragement. We need good reports. When I hear about missionaries that are dealing with not enough funds to stay on the field, when I hear about missionaries who don't have enough health to go on the field, when I have a friend who hasn't been able to get on the mission field for a year and a half because of a global pandemic, what I need to be able to give to this person is encouragement. We have so many negative reports that we need to face face on and acknowledge when something's bad. But because of the reality of bad, there's the necessity of encouragement. I don't know what your week is going to hold. I really don't. I pray that it holds rainbows and butterflies. But do you know what has to happen for there to be rainbows? Sorry, Randy. Rain. Don't worry, he hasn't prayed for rain in like three months. I don't know what your week will hold, but I know who holds you this week. And I want you to stand firm in him. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for who you are. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your mercy. Please strengthen everyone here. Help them to hold firm whenever everything says not to hold firm. Help everyone here to have a clear vision of Christ and not to be led into any false ways. Help us to be people of love.